Should be here in a second. All right, you're live. Good evening and welcome to our final event in our 2020 fall speaker series in the equine industry program at the University of Louisville. Before we get to our final topic, I'd like to thank our friends and partners at Horse Racing Nation and Mark Midland for sponsoring our event this evening and his help on the technical side and of course, all of their support. I'd like to thank Liz Young as well on my team. She's worked with all the communications through our panels this fall and she's helped all of our moderators funneling your questions to the moderators to ask our panelists. And finally, a special thanks to my entire team in the equine industry program for developing these panel topics. The discussions have centered on topical issues in the industry and I've hope you, I hope you've been able to gain something from them. We were really not sure how these sessions will be received given the online format. However, we've been really thrilled with the results and especially with your participation. A reminder, the recording will be available after the event as well tonight, in case you wanna revisit it at a later date or tell a friend. We'll also have time for questions, so please use the chat in Facebook Live to submit those through the course of our discussions. As we put together our panels for the speaker series, our goal was to have two panels that really focused on relevant industry issues. And the third panel is one I like to reserve for a personality who I really hope is more entertaining yet still has that educational component, i.e. someone who had an impact on our sport and has a really interesting story to tell. And tonight we have that for you and we have a very special guest. Hall of Fame jockey Pat Day may not have been born in Louisville, but he's truly an adopted son of the city of Louisville. His name is synonymous with horse racing. And when you think of Churchill Downs, you think of the Derby first and likely Pat Day second. If you go to Churchill Downs, there's a bronze statue of Pat Day located in the paddock garden near a life-size bronze of Aristides, the first winner of the Kentucky Derby back in 1975. And I wanna show you what that statue looks like right now. And there's a shot of the statue. After retiring from the saddle, Pat's career has taken a different turn, one focused on his deep and his passionate faith. He is as much known for his work off the racetrack as he is for his work on it. Here's some incredible numbers and accomplishments from Pat's career. When he retired on August 4th, 2005, he had earned a record $297 million, was the current record at the time for earnings on the racetrack. He ranked fourth in total victories with 8,803. That included 2,482 wins at Churchill Downs, which encompassed 156 stake wins. He earned an astounding 34 meet riding titles. He fared very well at Keeneland as well, where he won 918 races, including 95 stakes, and he had 22 riding titles at Keeneland. He also dominated at Oakland Park in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where he won 12 riding titles. He's the only jockey to have ridden in 21 consecutive Kentucky Derbies. He had eight winners out of nine mounts one day at Arlington Park back on September 13th, 1989. He had seven winning mounts on a day on June 20th in 1984. He had four days where he had six winners on a card and he had 21 days where he piloted home five winners. Some of his accomplishments, he won the Jockey Club Gold Cup three times. He took home the Bluegrass Stakes at Keeneland four times. He won the Kentucky Oaks twice in 1988 and 2000. He captured the Breeders' Cup Classic four times, and we'll look at one of those tonight. He won the Kentucky Derby in 1992. He captured the Preakness five times, and he won the Belmont Stakes three times. Some of the amazing awards that he won over his career, he won the Eclipse Award for Outstanding Jockey, winning it four times. He was the US champion jockey by wins six times from 1982 to 1991. He was a champion jockey by earnings twice. 
He won some wonderful awards as well, including the George Wolfe Memorial Jockey Award in 1985. And this was voted on by his peers. And it was for the jockey who demonstrates the highest standards of professional and personal conduct. He, wore, he won the Mike Venezia Memorial Award in 1995 for extraordinary sportsmanship and citizenship. He won the Big Sport of Turfdom Award in 2005. And one of his most notable accomplishments, he was inducted into the National Museum Racing Hall of Fame in 1991 on August 8th. Pat has ridden such wonderful horses as Lady Secret, Theatrical, Dance Smartly, Lil E.T., Tabasco Cat, Unbridled, Wild Again, Favorite Trip, Java Gold, Louis Cortez, Seeking the Gold, Easy Goer, Summer Squall, Awesome Again, and so many more. When he retired, fellow Hall of Fame Mike Smith compared Day to an almost like Michael Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to give you a warm, please give a warm welcome to the legendary Pat Day. Good evening, Pat. Thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for having me on. A pleasure. I gave you a little bit of uh, Colorado in the background. I know you're from there, so that's where we're going to start. So I made my background the Rocky Mountains to make you feel a little bit at your second home. But Louisville's your primary home, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. My my wife and I and our daughter moved here in 91. You know, we came here spring and fall, started in 1980, uh, riding at Keeneland or Churchill in the spring and again in the fall. But uh, Colorado is where I'm from, but we made this our permanent base in 1991. That's great. Well, let's let's go back to the beginning. You were raised in a ranching and a farming ranching and farming community in Edwards, Colorado, not far from Vail, which is a resort town in Colorado. And your parents, Mickey and Carol, had three siblings. Talk a little bit about growing up in Edwards. Well, uh, we we originally we lived in Eagle for one year okay. before we moved out to Edwards and. Eagle, as you might know, is a big city of, I think the population is about 900. Uh, but mother and dad didn't want to raise their kids in town. They wanted to raise them out in the country. And so they bought a little piece of property there in Edwards. And uh, at the time, I thought we were uh, in no man's land. I certainly envied my uh, friends that were living in town and were able to, to, to enjoy the city life, if you would. But looking back, it was a great childhood. Uh, Mom and dad bought a couple of ponies when we first moved out there. And, and so we were around horses and we were helping the, the neighboring farmers and ranchers throughout the year. And, and um, when we weren't doing that, we was down playing in the creek or walking in the mountains with, uh, with the neighboring kids. So it was, a, it was just an unbelievable childhood. Uh, you know, I, I, I look back at it now and, and uh, uh, people wouldn't let their children do what we done then. You know, <laughs> my brother and I, we were on Lake Creek and, and just over on the other side of the mountain was Squaw Creek. And there was a family over there named the Carters. And we'd call Dan, Danny and David and early in the morning and say, we'll meet you up on top of the mountain. And so away we'd go and mother wouldn't, I mean, we'd be gone all day long. And uh, mother knew we was out there somewhere and trusted that we were in good shape, you know. Uh, uh, but it, I, I think about it and it was, uh, it was a great childhood. I was... I'm truly appreciative of uh, having been having been raised in the mountains of Colorado. Your dad, Mickey, was a tremendous horseman in his own right, and he owned a ranch and and he broke and trained horses for your neighbors. Talk about some of the things your father accomplished and how that influenced your early life. What kind of things did you learn from him? Well, as as you just said, he he took in young horses and broke them. Uh, in the evenings and weekends, and I had the opportunity to work alongside of him and, and help him in that regard. And just I just learned a lot of horsemanship skills, uh, just uh, a lot of horsemen, a lot of horse psychology, if you would, understanding the horse and, and uh, learning how to get along with them, how to get them to do what we wanted them to do. And, and um, uh, it was great just, uh, just chumming, chumming with my father and, and uh, picking up what I could, watching, and, and then as he instructed me on what to do. Well, I read an interesting story about the first time your dad put you up on this unbroken pony as a as a second grader. Uh, the pony ran off. You want to tell that story? Mm. Well, at that time, I had never never been around horses much. Uh, we'd lived in town just previous to moving out there, like I told you. And the only horses I seen was on TV, and 
anytime the guys on TV got on them, they kicked them in the belly and went, yeah, and away they went. And so when I got on this pony, Blackie, and, and kicked him and went, yeah, he responded favorably and took off. And the faster he ran, the louder I screamed. And around the corner of the house and down past the barn and out into the pasture where another horse that we had was standing. And when he got to that horse, he was shaken and scared. He stopped. I'm crying my eyes out. Dad come down there and, and uh, I jumped off in his arms. He sat me down on the ground, made sure I was okay. And, and then insisted that I get back on Blackie and ride him back to the house. At that point, I, I, that was the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, I didn't care if I ever got on another horse, but, uh, but dad made, he, made me get back on him and ride him back to the house. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that. I, I often wonder what direction my life might've taken had that spirit of fear, that, that seed of fear that was in my heart at the time, had it been given the opportunity to take root, uh, had, I, had I grown scared of horses because of that incident and then failed to, to, uh, to, you know, to go ahead and uh, would, would my life have developed in the way that it has? So uh, the horsemanship skills and, and uh, that, that incident in and of itself uh, was probably a pivotal, pivotal moment uh, in my life. Well, in addition to horsemanship skills, athleticism is important. And, you know, many people say pound for pound, uh, jockeys are the best athletes in the world. Um, you were quite the accomplished wrestler in your youth. Uh, you had a really great record. You were 77 and seven in four years. You won a state championship in your junior year. How did that athletic ability translate to the racetrack? Well, I, I, I think the, the um, obviously the, hand-eye coordination, the upper body strength, uh, overall strength and endurance. Uh, I think it all played a, played a role. I know that there's a number of other riders that, uh, that have wrestled previous to their riding career. And, and um, uh, I think it's a big boon in that regard. Um, I was very competitive and, and, you know, I weighed 93, 95 pounds my entire high school, you know, throughout high school. And so the only thing that the only sport that I could realistically participate in and be competitive was wrestling. And so I put my whole heart and soul into it. You know, I practiced hard, worked hard to, to be able to do what I'd done. The numbers are a bit misleading because uh, we were in a very small school, single A, and um, I wrestled the very lowest weight category all four years. And there's not very many juniors or seniors that were my size. So <laughs> I had a bit of an experience advantage over them. So the, the, the numbers can be a little bit misleading, but it was, uh, I, I think all of that, I think the, the event with, uh, with Blackie, when dad made me get back on him, I think the time uh, spent wrestling, honing those skills and, and certainly uh, enjoying the sweet taste of victory. Uh, all of that, uh, I think was part and parcel of what, uh, I think it was laying the groundwork for uh, what turned out to be my vocation, which was a professional jockey. You graduated high school in 1971, and you were going to be a professional rodeo cowboy. Um, you spent two years on the circuit. How'd that go? And uh, ultimately, what changed your mind? Well, actually, that started when I was nine years old. We started uh, uh, in the summertime. We'd participate in junior rodeos and little britches rodeos. And, and um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the, um, the challenge, uh, though I was never very good at, at it. And then uh, in high school, I was on the rodeo team. When I graduated from high school, I, I had a, a desire of, of, to become a professional bull rider. And, and uh, I just love going to rodeos. I love the competition. I love the nomadic lifestyle and, and the camaraderie amongst the, amongst the cowboys. And, and uh, I, I, I had very limited amount of success, but uh, I believe that that time played me well for two reasons. Number one, it, it taught me how to fall. Uh, I don't know if you watch very many bull ridings, but uh, when you, if you make the whistle and get off, you still got to run for the fence. And if you get bucked off, you better hit the ground rolling and jump up and run for the fence because the bull's going to turn around and, and endeavor to get you. And so uh, I think that time in the rodeo arena helped me to learn how to fall or at least not be afraid of falling. And, and, uh, but more importantly, it got me in front of people that, that uh, recognized I had no ability to ride bulls I was small in stature and small in size, and they recommended that I should look into being a jockey. <laughs> and 
<laughs> and a uh, fellow gave me his name and number and said, if you ever have an interest, give me a call. And so in the fall of 1972, I did. End of the rodeo season, I gave him a call and he ultimately got me a, a job on a thoroughbred farm in California that introduced me to the great sport of horse racing. Yeah, and that's where I was going to go next. You, uh, you went out to West Coast trainer Farrell Jones and um, his farm manager, Gene Cummings, but you only lasted a month out there. What happened? Well, I'd never been to the races, Sean. I'd never seen a race. When, uh, up in the mountains where I was raised, we didn't have TV, so I'd never seen a race on TV, never been to the race. I knew nothing about racing. I, I'd heard of Bill Shoemaker, Eddie Arcaro, and the Kentucky Derby. That was the extent of my knowledge, so uh, keep that in mind. Now, I, I go to California. I sat down with Mr. Jones and Mr. Cummins, and they said, you want to be a jockey? And I said, yeah, I want to be a jockey. Now, I don't know what I was expecting, <laughs> but they said, they said, you need to be on the farm for two to three years, learn the business from the ground up. Absolute correct way to go. Um, and they said, at the end of that period of time, depending on how quickly you catch on, then we'll send you to the racetrack. You'll continue to hone your skills. You'll experience life at the racetrack. And you'll do that, you know, study the films, watch the races, do that for another year, and you'll be ready to, to start riding. And I thought, two to three years on the farm, and then another year before I really get to compete. And uh, at the end of a month, I said, you know, I really don't want to do this. Uh, I, I don't want to do this for two to three years before I can actually compete. And uh, so I left. Uh, and when I did, when I left the farm at the end of January in 73, being a jockey was the furthest thing from my mind. I, I, was, I was intent on going back and pursuing a career as a professional bull rider. Uh, I went to Las Vegas, thought I would get a job doing whatever until springtime and, and then try to get back on the road going to rodeos. And uh, I got to Vegas, I couldn't find a job. I couldn't get a job washing dishes. And at that time, they had a little racetrack out in Henderson, which is a suburb of Los, well, it was a suburb. Now it's, it's all kind of part grown of up and part of the city. Hmm. But um, they, they had a little racetrack out there and they were trying to get, had some horses, some people out there using it for a winter training track. And uh, they said they need some help. And so I went out there and applied for the job and, and uh, they were desperate. Uh, so I, I got a job working for a man named Steve Talbot. I think he had four or five horses. And he said, I'll give you $2 a head to gallop my horses. And so I was getting on three or four horses every day for $2 a head. And I'd done that for a couple of months. And then Steve was the clerk of scales on the fair circuit in Arizona. And so it was time for him to go to Arizona and take up his duties down there on the fair circuit and he invited me to follow him with him, follow him, meet him down there and he would introduce me to people and help me to continue to pursue my career as a, as a jockey. And um, so I did, uh, although I was about a week behind him, I still wasn't sure that that's what I wanted to do, but I met him, I believe it was in Sonoida, um, Sonoida or Duncan Safford, one of those little fair, uh, towns down there. And he introduced me to some people. I started galloping some horses in the morning um, they just ran on the weekends there, uh, Saturdays and Sundays. And, um, uh, I got a job closing the tailgates, uh, on the starting gate, kind of subsidized my income and, uh, went to the fairs. And then when they moved to Prescott for the summer, uh, I got introduced to a man named Carl Pugh, who had been a professional team roper. Uh, he'd started training racehorses just a couple of years previous. And, him and I just became the best of friends. Uh, he had like 30 head of horses and, and he hired me to gallop all of his horses there at Prescott. And uh, you couldn't drive me away from the barn. I just, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be with Carl. And uh, of course he was, uh, he, he shot his own horses. We would go into Phoenix once a week and get a load of hay or star or whatever, bring it back to Prescott. And so I just became very close with him and his family. By the middle of the summer, I told him, in, in addition to that, I was, pony and his horses taking him to the starting gate so now I'm up close to the gate for the start of the race and I was really getting the bug getting the itch to ride so by the middle of the summer I told Carl I said you know I, I really want to start riding and he said well I'll hold your contract which you know back in the day you had to have a contract holder he said I'll hold your contract and let you ride a few of my horses and that was the middle of July and so the first horse I rode for him ran second just got beat a nose and I believe we rode that week, the rest of that weekend and the next weekend. 
And then on the 29th of July, 1973, the last race of the day on a horse for Carl. His horse, the horse's name was Four Blunge, uh, F-O-R-E-B-L-U-N-G-E-D. Uh, last race of the day, got up in the shadow of the wire on old sloppy racetrack and won. And um, uh, that was, uh, it, I mean, that was a, a tremendous thrill. And, and uh, but that was uh, the beginning of my, of my racing career. So I, I read where the purse for that race was a whopping six hundred and thirty one dollars. Yeah, I think my 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 10 percent of the winner's share was 30 or thirty five dollars or something like that. Well, you've but, come a uh, long way from that. Um, yeah. You know, you know what, Sean, I'll be honest with you. At that time, I'd have paid for the opportunity. You I'm know, bad. when you go to a rodeo, you, you pay an entry fee and then you depend upon the luck of the draw. If you get something that would luck hard enough that you know, that you can score high enough to, to, to win some money, then you have, you've got to make the whistle. And, and if you don't, well, you, you, you know, you, you got to pay your way home. And here I am getting to participate in the races and they're going to pay me to participate. And then they're going to give me even more if I win. I was like, Whew, it, it doesn't get any better than this. So the, the 10% of the $600 pot, that was, that was secondary. And you know what remained that way tr throughout my career? It was never about the money. I mean, I, I wanted to win. It didn't matter if it was a, the first race on a Wednesday or the Kentucky Derby on the first Saturday. It was, uh, I, just, I just wanted to win. It was the thrill of winning. So after that first winner in 73, before your arrival at Churchill in 1980, you jumped all over the country. <laughs> um, you spent some time in New York and you described those experiences and something I thought was rather interesting. You called it finishing school. You rode with some of the great riders. What do you remember about that period in your life when you were jumping around before you set your roots down in Kentucky? Well, I was, it was a bit of a roller coaster ride, but uh, everywhere I went, you know, there, there's good riders all over the country. They might, you know, obviously the, uh, the largest amount, number of the best riders are located in the better racing localities, New York, California, and now Kentucky. Uh, but at the time, the best riders were West Coast and East Coast. And, uh, but in, in between, there was, uh, there was uh, uh, some very good riders that I got to ride against. And, and I would watch them. I would watch what they do and, and how they done it. And I would endeavor to replicate what they were doing. And if it felt comfortable, I would, I would continue to use that. Uh, but going into New York with uh, Cordero and Velasquez and Ron Turcott and Eddie Maple and, and uh, Braulio Baeza and, and uh, Helio Doro uh, Gustinas. And I mean, it was just a, a, a room full of Hall of Fame writers. Um, and they cut me no slack. <laughs> you know, they, they, they took me to school. And, and it, was, uh, it was a great education. And, and as you just said, it, yeah, it, was, uh, it was like a finishing school. Uh, but my mind was not, my ability far surpassed my mind. Uh, I was very immature. Um, I, I wasn't ready uh, to handle the success that, uh, that I enjoyed almost immediately. Well, immediately, I, I won, won my first race two weeks after I started by January of 1974, a year after I was on the farm, I was the leading rider at Turf Paradise. Um, you know, the success came so fast and furious, I, I, I didn't have the appreciation for it or the respect for the talent and ability that I had uh, that I really should have had. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was riding, winning races, and then got involved in a, in a sordid life uh, after the races, um, looking for higher highs, if you would. Just winning the races wasn't enough. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. And in the midst of that, I was continuing to be highly successful. But uh, I went into New York. I wasn't mature enough to uh, handle the racing scene, though I, I learned a significant amount. Uh, I came back to the Midwest after two, two years up there and uh, uh, then started to get my act together a little better. Uh, met my wife, uh, Sheila. We got married in 1979. Uh, that had a real stabilizing effect on my life. But uh, uh, the real stabilizing uh, moment in time came when, when I, I invited Christ into my heart in January of 84. Yeah, we'll get to that in one minute. Cause I want, I, I do want to talk about that, Pat. Um, but you met your wife and then 
did you guys make the collective decision to move to Louisville in 1980 or what, what precipitated that decision to come to Churchill? Was it your first go there or you just decided that that's where you wanted to be? What, what, what was in your mind in that move at that time? Well, we'd, we'd been riding in Chicago and um, we went to New Orleans for the winter and came back to, uh, you know, to Chicago for the spring and summer and fall and then back to, to uh, the fairgrounds. Um, in the fall of 1979, we got married June 30th. A month and a day later, I fell and broke my collarbone. And so since we hadn't taken a honeymoon, we decided to uh, take a little honeymoon re recuperation period. Seven weeks later, I came back and started riding. By that time, the racing had moved across town to Sportsman's Park, and I fell one evening. I was laying second. The horse broke his leg and fell, and seven out of ten horses fell. Um, I got knocked out, uh, beat up, banged up, but no uh, broken bones. But uh, that fall at Sportsman's Park, um, it, it caused me to rethink about riding there. Uh, as you know, Sportsman's Park was a bull ring. Yeah. It had been a half mile racetrack, which means real tight turns banked. Uh, they had extended that to five eighths of a mile. So now you got longer straightaways. You build up a bigger head of steam before you get to the turns and, and you got to be fearless. You got to, yeah, there, there, there's a real key, a real trick to riding a bull ring. And you can't be hesitant. You can't be timid. You got to ride into the turns. And uh, I just didn't, I didn't want to go back there. And so in the spring of 1980, we came to Keeneland. Uh, I had a fairly decent meet at Keeneland. Then we came here for the first week uh, before we went on to Chicago. I never, I didn't win a race at Churchill. I uh, didn't have any mounts on Derby Day that year. So the night before the Derby, on, on Derby Eve, uh, Sheila and I, my wife, loaded up and uh, drove on to Chicago and, and uh, started getting ready for the summer meet at Arlington. And, um, and then came back that fall to Keeneland and Churchill, started to get some business together, started to get some traction, and, um, uh, and then have been coming here nearly every spring and fall since then. You won that riding title in the fall on your first trip back, didn't you? Uh, I, you know, I don't remember, to be quite honest with you. I think you did. I, I think in my research, I found that you did that, and then you would subsequently go on to shatter all the all the records over the next 26 years and you made Louisville your base well your career was on the ascent but as you said your personal life wasn't going that well um there's an infamous story about where you had the opportunity to be the national leading rider in number of wins for the first time in 1982 and you chartered a flight to delta downs can you tell that story <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. We, we've been riding, you know, pretty hard all, all fall and, and uh, here at Churchill and, and then went immediately to the fairgrounds chasing the, the national riding title. We thought we were in a position to, to win that, uh, battling head and head with Angel Cordero, who's riding in New York. And, and uh, so December 31st, uh, at the end of the racing program at the fairgrounds, uh, we were tied up at 395 winners on the year. And the only racetrack in North America that was right, running that evening was Delta Downs. And because of the close proximity to New Orleans, I was able to charter a flight, flew down there, uh, secured the mount on a couple of, of horses. They both won. Uh, the one that secured the national riding title for me was a horse called Dana's Woof Woof. <laughs> You've heard of him, right? No, boy, he should be. A... <laughs> no, he, he'll stand out forever in my heart because he carried me to victory and secured the national riding title. And <clears throat> when we left the, I was just the pilot and I, and we left the racetrack that night, stopped at a liquor store, got a six pack of beer, got on the plane and, and uh, flew back to New Orleans. And when we got to New Orleans, um, uh, my wife had rented a room at the fairgrounds and they were having a New Year's Eve slash celebration party. And and uh, uh, I got to the party, of course, all the beer was gone and the pilot wasn't drinking. Now I get to the, to the party and somebody handed me a big glass beer mug and somebody else handed me some pills. And that was the last I clearly remember for the next two weeks. Uh, I was too busy celebrating. Uh, you know, it's a um, sad state of affairs, but that's, uh, that was my mindset at the time. 
as I said earlier, I, I had a lack of appreciation for and respect uh, for the talent and ability that uh, that the Lord had blessed me with, uh, the opportunities that I had, the success that I was enjoying. Uh, I was taking full credit for all of that. And um, I thought that I deserved the, the party, I guess. And so I did, I partied hard for two weeks. When I came out of my drug and alcohol induced stupor, uh, I discovered that the fleeting feeling of succeeding was gone, a tremendous accomplishment but it did not lend itself to the long-term joy, peace, contentment, sense of fulfillment that I had anticipated that it would. Uh, what I thought about winning the national writing title and actually winning the national writing title, what that uh, meant to me, what it, what it gave me were two different things. Uh, I found the pot at the end of the rainbow, it was empty. I got a hold of the brass ring, it was attached to nothing. Uh, again, not to take away from the, the uh, it's tremendous. It was a tremendous accomplishment and it's one that I'm very proud of, but uh, I made the startling discovery that it would not, could not fill this void in my heart. Uh, I, I recognized that there was, there was something missing, something lacking. Uh, from the outside looking in, I, I should have been the happiest man in the world. A beautiful wife, successful career, just won the national writing title, got my name up in lights. I should have been, had a twinkle in my eye and a dance in my step, and I didn't. I was very disillusioned with life, if you would. And I remember going out at night, Sean, and looking up into the sky and just screaming into the heavens, what am I here for? What, what is the purpose in all this? Because it just wasn't making any sense. I mean, I enjoyed racing. I enjoyed winning. I, as I said, I had a beautiful wife. We're financially secure. Got everything the world says is supposed to make you happy, joyful, peaceful, contented. And I wasn't. I think that incident sent me searching uh, as I wasn't getting any answers. I, I'm looking into the heavens and screaming, what am I here for? Wasn't getting any answers. Uh, as the Lord would have it, I was the leading writer again in 1983. My wife and I were vacationing in Colorado in January of 1984 with my family. On January 27th, she drove me into Denver. I got on a plane and flew to Miami, Florida, where I was scheduled to ride in a race the next day. And when we got in, when I got checked, I got, got to Miami, checked into a hotel near the airport, got in my room, flipped the TV set on and started getting ready for bed. And the program on that particular channel happened to be a Jimmy Swagger televised crusade. Now, I'm looking for answers to life. And the last place I thought you would find it was through a, te uh, you know, a television evangelist. He was, that was the last thing I wanted to listen to. And so when I'm all ready for bed, I ran through the channels on the dial. That was one of them old time TV sets. You know, you had to, no remote. You actually had to turn the dial by hand. Got all the way around the dial back to Jimmy Swigert. Nothing caught my attention. Turned the TV off and went to bed. When my head hit the pillow, I went sound asleep. Sat, slept so soundly that when I awoke, I thought I'd been sleeping for six or eight hours. But I awoke to the distinct feeling that there was, there was a presence in that room with me. There was that at first it was a little bit disconcerting. Now I sat up right in bed and I looked around. I couldn't see anything, but I could feel the presence there with me. And I don't know if at that moment the Lord prompted me to get up and, and turn the TV on, or if I'd done that on my own accord, hoping that the noise and the light would cause these feelings to dissipate. But I walked over, I turned the TV on. As the picture materialized on the screen, I realized instantly, I, I've, I've not been sleeping very long because Jimmy Swigert's still on TV. And at that moment, it, it was, it was a, at the moment in the, in the program when he's completed delivering his message of salvation and he's extending the invitation to the viewing audience, to those that would be so inclined to invite Christ into their life. And at that moment, it was like the scales were removed from my eyes. I recognized and realized that the presence there with me was the spirit of the living God and I knew that I knew that I knew that that was the missing piece to the puzzle. I knew that that's what I wanted, what I needed. And I fell on my face and wept and cried and, and invited Christ into my life, never to be the same again. I don't know how long I was there. I finally got up and went back to bed. When I got up and went outside the next day, it was like the whole world had taken on a whole new look. You know, the grass was greener, the sky was bluer, the air was clearer, but the world hadn't changed, I had changed. I went on and rode the race that afternoon, uh, a horse for uh, Shug McGahee named Eminency. I think he finished second or third. 
But uh, I got on a plane the next evening and to go back to Colorado. We got up in here and got leveled off and the stewardess came down the aisle there with the drink cart. <clears throat> and she got to me and asked me if I would like a drink. Now, normally I would get two bottles of those little bottles of booze because I wouldn't want to run out before she got back. But when she asked me if I wanted a drink, I, said, I snarled at her, I said, no. And she gave me a real funny look and walked on. And I thought about that for just a moment. I was like, now why would I respond in, in that gruff way? Why, a simple no thank you would have, would have sufficed. And then the Lord reminded me that under normal circumstances, I would get two of those little bottles of booze. And at that moment, I realized that not only did I not want the alcoholic beverage, but I found it to be repulsive. And I realized that at the moment that I invited Christ into my heart, that he broke the chains of bondage and set me free from that addiction to alcohol, to drugs, to a sordid life. I was a new creature. The, the word of God tells us that when you become born again, you become a new creature. The old things are passed away. and Behold, all things become new again. I was a new creature in Christ. And uh, so got set free from the bondage of drugs and alcohol. Now I get back to Colorado. My wife met me. We drove to uh, Arkansas where we were going to begin writing. And, and now I'm wondering, well, what do I do with my life? Maybe, maybe I should go to the seminary. Maybe I should become a minister. Maybe I should leave the racetrack. And uh, it, first day at the racetrack, uh, went out to work some horses. And I seen a friend of mine, Sam Maple, uh, walking through the barns. And he had a guy that had a big old cowboy hat on. And that kind of drew, you know, got my attention. And Sammy seen me and he hollered at me and said, Pat, he said, why don't you come over and come on over here and meet our new chaplain. I didn't even know they had a chaplain, let alone a new one. And so I went running over there and I just thought for sure that Mike would be able to, that the chaplain would be able to give me some direction. Sammy introduced me to this man. His name was Mike Spencer. He ultimately became my best friend and spiritual mentor, took me under his wing and, and uh, helped me to grow as a Christian and, and as a man. But um, he ultimately helped me to, to, to get my arms around what actually happened that night in the hotel room. And as I shared with them what had happened and my, my uh, questioning about what, what do I do now? Should I continue writing? Should I go to the seminary? And so he came up with the novel idea of praying. <laughs> he said, let's pray about it. Let's see what the Lord has to say. And so we did. Uh, we prayed about it. We sought the scriptures. Through that process, the Lord revealed to me that he had saved me to work within the racing industry, not to leave it. Take the talent, take the ability, do the best that I possibly could, but all the while being open to opportunities to give him the praise, the honor, and the glory. Use that uh, writing career as a platform with which to get people's attention upon getting their attention to look to the Lord to give him the praise, the honor, and the glory. And so... It, the, the only vehicle then is now that's actively endeavoring to do that, to bring the gospel message to the horse racing industry is the racetrack chaplaincy. And so at that moment, I throwed in my lot with them, became very, very, uh, uh, very much a part of them, very supportive of the work that they're doing. And, and of course, it gave me a newfound reason uh, to pursue my career uh, as a jockey. I was no longer riding to put my name up in lights. I was no, no longer riding to put the accolade for the accolades and the pats on the back. I was, I was writing for Jesus. Uh, the Bible says, do all that you do with all of your heart as though you were doing it unto the Lord and not unto man. And that was, that was my, my focus. I wanted to do it and do it with excellence, do it to the very best of my ability. Uh, and then in the midst of that, to conduct myself in a manner that would be pleasing to the Lord first and foremost, uh, and would bring praise and honor and glory in his holy name. So you had this new outlook on life and you, you went back to writing and doing, doing your, your job. How was that received? How was your new outlook received on the backstretch? Because you were quite vocal in your faith. How was that received by the folks on the backstretch and the people that you worked with? Well, I, you know, it, it, at first, I think they looked at me in kind of a sidelong look and thought I must have gotten into some really bad drugs somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, I think they, they welcomed the change, um, but were undecided about uh, my commitment to the Lord. And, and I think they stood back and watched. 
Uh, I think there were some naysayers. I think there were some that thought, that, yeah, yeah, this will pass and he'll be back to himself. And, and that never happened. Uh, I think there were, there were those that probably mocked me behind my back. Um, nobody ever said anything to my face, but um, I think they stood back and watched and, and uh, by the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, we, we were able to, for the most part, maintain our focus and, and conduct ourselves uh, in, a, in a manner and in a fashion that would, uh, that would rightly represent the Lord, that would be pleasing uh, to the Lord. And, and I can't take credit for that. Uh, it was the Lord in me that, uh, and my desire to please him, that enabled me to, to maintain that focus. So coincidentally, about that time in the spring of 1984, a little four-year-old arrived at fairgrounds called Wild Again. You won the New Orleans Handicap on him, and two races later, you won the Oakland Park Handicap in April. Wild Again would make eight more starts with only one win leading up to the inaugural Breeders' Cup Classic that was run at Hollywood Park in 1984. And the owners supplemented him to the race at a whopping fee of 360000 and they named Eddie Maple to ride. Eddie was also named on track baron in that race. How did you get that mount in the uh, Breeders' Cup Classic? Well, I, I believe there was some divine intervention, Sean. Um, you know, I, I look back and, and I think my whole life has been divinely directed. I think God's had his hand on me, guiding, directing, watching over, protecting uh, my entire life. I just, uh, you know, I can't take credit for where I am or what I am. I am what I am by the grace of God. You know, I, I, I told you that we prayed about staying and racing and the Lord revealed to me that I was to stay in the game, not to leave it. And of course, at that moment, I immediately thought of the Kentucky Derby. I thought there's, there's no bigger platform in all of racing than the Kentucky Derby. And so I thought I must be going to win the Derby. A uh, little did I know that it wouldn't be for six years, but uh, so I prepared this little mini sermon and I was all ready to give the whole world a, 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 a I thought it was a really good mini sermon uh, after I was, you know, on the podium with Jim McKay after the Derby and that didn't happen. Well, then roll up, you know, roll into the fall and here's the Breeders' Cup. And, and um, so they had changed uh, Hollywood Park where they hosted the first Breeders' Cup had been a mile racetrack. And they extended that, made it a mile and an eighth. And so I thought, well, I need to go out and just get a feel for the track and kind of settle in. And so I was there on Wednesday when the overnight, uh, you know, the overnight is the uh, piece of paper that has all the races and horses, uh, horses in the races and their trainers and own, uh, jockeys. And so I was in the jockey's room when the, when the overnight came in for the Saturday races. And I'm looking down through there and I had some a couple of mounts on the card and I didn't have anything in the classic. And when I got to the classic race, here was wild again. And he didn't have a rider named on him at the, on the overnight. Now you're correct. Eddie Maple had the option. Uh, he was, he was, he had wild again and Leroy Jolly's horse. I think it was track Baron. Track right? Baron. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, Leroy didn't tell anybody which way he was going until they, until the entries. Uh, had he gone into the sprint instead of the classic, Eddie would have rode it uh, wild again. But uh, when he went off to, to go in the, in the classic, Eddie was committed to track Baron. And so anyhow, I'm in the jocks room. I see that wild again doesn't have a rider. And so I went running to the front. I said, I was gonna have the clerk of scales call the announcer and have him page for trainer Vincent Timpany to, to you know, call me. I was gonna try to make the mount on him. And uh, so when I came in from the jockey's room into the area where the clerk of scales desk is, in from the outside came Vincent Timpany and Bill Allen, one of the primary owners of, of uh, Wild Again. And they said, would you? I said, can I? And they said, would you? Uh, they were coming to see if I would ride him. Uh, and so then I, I went and blew him out on Friday morning. He blew out in 36. I, you know, he, he, was, he was as good as you could get him. But I'll be honest with you, I still thought he was up against it. You know, that was a, it was a short field, but it was well, a very deep field. Before you go too deep, let's show that race because it ultimately changed your life. Let me put it up and let's take a quick look at the Breeders' Cup Classic from 1984.
Well, I'm having a technical issue and I apologize. Bear with me for a moment. Absolutely. You know, you work this stuff out and you test it and it all works. Because this was truly one of the great races. You actually said it, uh, <laughs> it, it changed your career. You, I, I read a quote from you and I, I, I apologize, I'm not able to get the race up. You said, I expected a big effort from him, but I thought he was in way over his head. He ended up running the race of his life. He never tried any harder. It still gives me chills thinking about the effort he put forth. Every jump in the stretch, I heard him grunt. He would just throw, he just wouldn't throw in the towel. I've never been on a horse that tried any harder than he did that day. And I, I read something where you said he was throwing divots 20 feet in the air. Yeah, and, and I didn't realize that until I seen the head on. And if you watch the head on, you can see when he when he kicks the dirt up, they're, they're going and just indicative of how hard he was digging in and trying. Um, you know, it it, um, it it was an incredibly deep field, slew of gold, gate dancer, desert wine, precisionist. Uh, he was, in, in reality, I thought he was probably fourth or fifth best. Uh, but, you know, if, you, if you're in them, you can win them. And he certainly showed that to me that day. I've got the video now, Pat. So hang on. Here we Great. go. Okay. Here's Precisionist to join him, and in between horses, it's wild again. Two lengths back to Desert Wine, he's settled in the fourth, and the big horse, Slew of Gold, is off the rail, and he's racing fifth by four lengths. Track Baron is now racing in six, Canadian Factor toward the inside. Gate Dancer is the trailer, he's about 12 lengths off the lead, we've got a three-ply battle for the lead around the turn. And wild again, emerges with the lead. Precisionist on the outside. Mugatee toward the rail. The first quarter, a snappy 22 and 3 fifths seconds. They enter the back stretch. Wild again, battles it out and takes the lead now by three quarters of a length. The half and 45 and 3. Precisionist pressures the pacemaker from the outside. Toward the inside, it's Mugatee now. He's dropped back third. A gap of four lengths to Desert Wine, racing in fourth. Slew of gold is still fifth. He's settled in the fifth place now, and he's beginning to move up on the outside a gap of four to track baron gate dancer is second to last with a half a mile to run and canadian factor is far behind as the field heads for the far turn three quarters and one ten and three and slew a goal now he's charging on the outside up to engage the leader wild again it's wild again with the lead slew a gold cordero board attacks now with three furlongs to go those two are matching stride for stride here comes track baron he's putting in his run and gate He's in full stride now, and he swings wide for the final quarter mile. On the inside, wild again is game, and he's holding on to the lead by a head. Slew of gold is right at his neck. Here comes Gate Dancer on the outside there in the final furlong. Wild again, desperately holding on to the lead. Slew of gold is right there in between horses. Gate Dancer on the outside. What a finish. Wild again. Gate Dancer. Slew of gold in between them. Those three in a drum. Get a little chuckle there. <laughs> oh, fun memories. Just like it was yesterday, right? There was an inquiry in the race. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. Well, but it didn't what? involve you ultimately, right? It, I'm sorry? It didn't involve you, right? It did involve me. It did? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all three numbers when I came back. Myself, Desert Wine, uh, I mean, uh, Slew of Gold and and uh, gate dancer all three numbers were were flashing uh you know that that wild again blew out for the race well he broke well uh we ran away from the gate fine and then mugga t who is a uh the rabbit in the race for for uh slew of gold with terry lipham uh he took he, i don't know if he's seen something but he kind of took a little step out and when he did wild again took a little step out and when he done that i just instinctively tightened up on the left rein to 
you know, to, in case I needed to take corrective action. And as soon as I moved, he locked onto the bridle and took off. Um, being head and head in 22 and change, going to the lead in 45 and change, that was not part of the game plan. But uh, he was kind of hanging on that left rein, which he had a tendency to do all the way down the backside and around the turn. And when Slew of Gold came to me at the top of the stretch, he had every right and every reason in the world to just throw in the towel. Uh, three quarters and 10 and change. And, you know, but he refused. When Slew of Gold got to him, he looked him in the eye and it was like Wild again said, not today. And, uh, you know, he ran the last quarter of a mile on, on sheer, sheer guts and intestinal fortitude. He, he heart and intestinal fortitude because he was, he was plum limber legged, but he just refused to give up. It was almost as if he knew that his, his people had so much confidence in him that they would put up $360,000 to make him eligible to run against them kind. And he refused to let him down. And uh, I just, it still gives me goosebumps to think about how hard he was trying and how much he was putting into it, left it all on the field. So you had this win that catapulted your career. And in the meanwhile, your personal life was taken off and well as well. In 1987, you were blessed in a different way when you adopted your daughter, Irene. Elizabeth. Well, that was, that was a, a, another tremendous blessing. Um, my wife and I had been trying to have, have a child and, uh, that was, uh, we, we weren't being successful in that regard. And then on a Saturday evening, I got a call from our chaplain, said he needed to talk to us. Uh, my wife and I went over to him and his wife's house and uh, he shared with us that there was a young lady that had gotten pregnant out of wedlock and uh, didn't think that she was uh, in a position to raise the baby and would we be interested? And uh, would, would we consider adopting her? And of course, Mike and Davelin, uh, they knew that we would pray about it and we would, we would respond uh, in the manner that the Lord would have us to. And so uh, when, when Mike shared that with us, we prayed about it. My wife and I went home. I had to go to California the next morning. I had to go out there to ride. So uh, Sheila drove me to Little Rock and I got on a plane and all the way to California, I'm praying now, Lord, uh, you have to move on Sheila's heart. This has to be, you know, this has to be both of us. And, and if it's from her, if it, this is from you, you have to, you have to let, her, let, let us know. And, and all the way out there and all the way back. And so I got back, took the red eye back, got back on Monday morning. <clears throat> she picked me up and I got in the car and, my dear friend, Donnie Macbeth, uh, I don't know if you have heard of Donnie Macbeth. Oh, but yes, very familiar. He, yeah, well, he had, he had passed away overnight uh, while I was in transit. And um, so he got in the car and Sheila said, Donnie passed away last night. And so it very sober mood. And, and so we're riding and no conversation. And suddenly out of the, <laughs> out of the clear blue, she said, I'm going to put the baby seat in the middle in the back. And I was like, whoa, wait say that again? She said, I want to put the baby seat in the middle in the back because you, you don't know if you're going to get hit from the right side or the left side. She'll be more, he, we didn't know anything about the baby. We just knew that this was from God and she was going to put the baby seat in the middle of the seat in the back and she, to keep her, keep the baby safe. And I said, oh, we let's pull in here. Let's get a cup of coffee. And uh, so we did. Uh, she was born. That was on Monday. She was born on Tuesday afternoon, and we brought her home on Wednesday. Uh, it's a great story. Five, five days to parenthood. Uh, God just, God is so good. You know, it's, it's like he took this beautiful little girl and just laid her in our arms. I mean, she's a, she's a tremendous gift from God, and uh, we've just been overjoyed uh, that he would entrust us uh, with the privilege, the pleasure, and, and the responsibility of raising this young lady. And I'm happy to say she turned into a nice young, nice young lady, uh, a wonderful wife to her husband, and uh, certainly makes her mother and I proud. Well, good parents will do that. Uh, you should take some of the credit there, Pat. So things were going great in your personal life. And, and then along comes 1989 and a special cult. Uh, the pers your personal pick for the best horse you ever rode, Easy Goer, a son of Alidar, who faced his own version of Affirmed in Charlie Whittingham's Sunday Silence. These two guys squared off so many times in the Triple Crown. Uh, Sunday Silence won the Derby and the Preakness. And Easy Goer came back in an incredible 
dominating Belmont that I want to show right now, which was the second fastest in Belmont history. So let's show the Belmont stakes. La Voyageur leading by a length and a half. Kentucky Derby and Preakness winner Sunday Silence is second by a length. Rock Point is third by a neck on the outside. Easy goer on the rail is Triple Buck about two to Firemaker. Then Hookster about three to Awe Inspiring. Then in by a band. Irish actor remains in 10th. The half 47 flat. The pace has eased a bit as La Voyageur continues to lead by two and a half. Sunday Silence remains in second. Easy Goer has now made a move. Easy Goer on the outside, a half, half length off of Sunday Silence in third. Then Rock Point, Triple Buck, and Fire Maker. Three quarters, 11 and 1. La Voyager continues to lead an easy pace at 11 and 1 into the far turn. That's still La Voyager. A length. Sunday Silence second, a length. Easy Goer is third. Sunday Silence now gaining some ground on the outside, but La Voyager still leads. About two to Easy Goer in third. Sunday Silence now within a half of La Voyager. Sunday Silence draws alongside La Voyager. Those two have a length and a half on Easy Goer. Easy Goer now makes a move. They round the far turn. Sunday Silence takes the lead by a neck. La Voyager on the rail on the outside. Easy Goer. Easy Goer on the outside takes over now by half. And Sunday Silence is second. La Voyager is back into third. They're in the stretch. It's easy goer on the outside getting clear now by two. Sunday. Oh no. <laughs> the video locked up. Oh. And he's going away. Silence for me. Oh, there we go. You would think with all the bandwidth we have we would have better video. Well, needless to say, the best part of this race call is gonna get missed because I can recreate it for you. Marshall He's Cassidy actually Look. says, New York's easy goer in front, which is one of my favorite race calls of all time. Pat, what do you remember about that? And what do you remember about easy goer? Well, he was just a tremendous individual, had a big engine, a big heart, uh, was under, uh, you know, Suge McGay just done an excellent job with this colt, and I was very privileged to, to get to ride him. Uh, rode him every time he ran. Uh, you, you just, you just shared that, uh, you know, him and him and uh, Sunday Silence had a pretty good rivalry going on there, beginning with the Derby, Preakness, Belmont, and continued on through the fall with the Breeders' Cup Classic. And the record doesn't bear it out, but. Uh, uh, you know, I, he, he ran second in the Derby, caught a track that he didn't like and basically never got out of second gear and finished second. Uh, I'll take credit for the loss in the, in the, in the Preakness. Had I, had I ridden him in the Preakness the way I did in a Belmont, I think it would have been the same outcome. Uh, I didn't, and subsequently we got beat a, just a zop. Uh, and then he came back and ran a brilliant race in the, in the Belmont, uh, was un, unbeaten leading into the classic, uh, but he, he'd kind of gone the other way on us when, the, when it come up time for the classic and, and uh, really his head wasn't in the game. Uh, he come out of the one hole that day uh, at, at Gulfstream Park out of the chute. <clears throat> As you might recall, there used to be a real high hedge uh, on the inside uh, it, coming out of the chute there. And when we got to the end of the hedge, he actually tried to go left. He, he kind of just leaned into the left and when I straightened him up, he got to climbing, just jumping up and down. And just wasn't, just wasn't happy. Just wasn't, did, didn't really want to be in a game. And uh, at that moment, I thought, boy, it's going to be a, it's going to be a long mile and a quarter. Uh, and then we got down into the turn. And <clears throat> when we turned up the backside, he changed over to his right lead and, and jumped into the bridle, ran right up in behind, uh, uh, right up alongside of, of uh, Sunday Silence. And as we're getting to the turn, and I'm feeling really good at that point. Uh, I was seeing shades of the Belmont. And uh, uh, about that time, we uh, changed leads, dropped into the ground, into the turn. When Sunday Silence changed leads and dropped into the turn, he accelerated. And when Easy Goer changed leads and dropped into the turn, he turned a bit loose. And uh, I went to work on him, shoving, pushing, screaming, whipping, uh, and getting, getting no response. 
came off the turn and he, and he was real slow about changing over to his right lead. Finally, about the eighth pole, he dropped down and gave me a little at the end. And uh, we came up, a, you know, a, a diminishing neck short uh, of getting the race, but uh, just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal colt. Uh, I remember in the, in the, uh, the Gotham early in the three-year-old year at New York, a flat mile. Uh, it, it, I mean, he, he was just gliding over the track. I never encouraged him. I just rode with him, uh, just let him do his thing. And he was a fifth of a second off the world record um, for a mile. And, and uh, I've often wondered if I'd have just, if I'd have realized we was going that fast, I might've been tempted to squeeze him a little bit. And we could have, you know, uh, certainly had, had a new record, but uh, just a, a great horse to ride. And as I said, I was very privileged uh, to have been a part of that team. So you had all the success, but the one race that eluded you was the Kentucky Derby. And it was the biggest race on the calendar. And that's going to change in 1992. You had a lot of success riding for Lynn Whiting, who was an incredible trainer. And you rode this young colt, Lil E.T., early in his career. What did you learn about him in those early races that gave you encouragement for that derby that was going to become yours? Well, he was a colt with quality, and he was in good hands. Um, I, I knew that uh, under Lynn's tutelage that uh, he would bring him over there uh, ready for a big, big effort. And of course, like everybody, I thought Arazi was, uh, you know, I'd, I'd ridden uh, against Arazi and the two-year-old champion uh, uh, juvenile, the Breeders' Cup juvenile at Churchill <clears throat> in the fall before, and, and uh, he was pretty spectacular, and everybody anticipated that he would duplicate that effort in the Derby. Uh, but Lily T came into the race in great shape, uh, again, under Lynn's uh, uh, tutelage. And, and um, uh, I remember the race that day, he warmed up good, acted good, had his head in the game. And, and uh, when we broke, he broke well, settled in. I uh, got in a little traffic just a bit going into the first turn. A horse kind of came out in front of him, uh, which was, had no bearing uh, on the end of the race, but. Uh, steady just momentarily. As soon as it, we was able, he got back in stride. He was cruising up the backside, Sean. I mean, I couldn't ask for him to be to be moving any better. D like my position, uh, we was in the second flight, and uh, going to the half mile pole. Here come a Rossi, uh with Patrick Valenzuela, and and he had his feet in the dashboard basically. I mean, he he had a ton of horse. It looked like, <laughs> and at that moment, I thought I was running for second money. Well, let's show that. Let's show that race now, and hopefully, I'll have some success with the video on this one, Pat. And Arazi on the outside is gaining ground with every stride, moving to the top of the stretch. Dance floor leads it by one. Casualize in second by ahead. Arazi on the outside. Now three of them tightly bunched as they turn for home. Dance floor at the rail with a short lead. Arazi is next. Middle of the racetrack, Lily T. Here comes Casualize putting in a run between horses. And down the stretch they come. Lily T on the outside with Pat Day takes command. Casualize is second and the others are dropping back. Coming through the stretch and to the wire. Lily T on the outside has the lead by one. Casualize is second. Lily T wins the derby by one with Pat Day aboard. Casualize second. Four back it was Dan. I let that video go a little bit longer because I really thought it was great after the race. You were celebrating. You were obviously praising God. And Gary Stevens rode up next to you. What do you say to you? Congratulations. That's it? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yeah. To what, I, what I remember. Now, Gary had been there and, and uh, he, knew, he knew what I was experiencing. And uh, he was happy for me. <clears throat> happy that I, uh, not happy that he got beat, obviously, but uh, happy for me to experience that. You know, I think, I think all of us in the game, regardless of what, you know, whether we're walking the hots or, or grooming the horses or exercising the horses, the owner, the trainer, everybody involved want to be involved with the Kentucky Derby winner. That's 
the Kentucky Derby is the cornerstone of the American racing calendar. And, and uh, it's the one that there's others out there that are worth more money and might mean more to a horse in the breeding shed or, or otherwise. But uh, the, the Derby is the one that everybody wants to win. And so Gary was just congratulating me and, and uh, he knew he knew what, you know, the, the, the joy that was running through my body at that moment. You know, you were talking before we showed the video, you were talking about the the ride down the backstretch and the incredible Arazi went by you. Um, and you have a reputation and at the time you earned a nickname called Patient Pat. And I think it was a full display here in this particular race. What did you think when Arazi went by you like that? Because oh, like thought, you said, p -Val was in the dashboard. Yeah. Well, I thought it was running for second money. Um, you know, because that's where he, that's the same point that he went by me in the two-year-old race, uh, the fall before in the two-year-old race, uh, he ran by me like that and then just kept getting smaller as he pulled away from me. I mean, just, you know, just, just kept opening up. Mm, excuse me. And, and that day in the Derby, after he went by me, I pulled out from behind horses and was following him and certainly watching Pat. Much to my surprise, he got about whatever, four or five links in front of me and then just maintained that. He didn't continue to accelerate away from me, which made me feel uh, pretty good. And then coming to the top of the stretch, I seen Pat kind of shuck the reins at him and, and stepped on the accelerator and he got no response. And that made me feel really good because I knew I had him. I looked on down the, floor, down the, the racetrack and casualized and danced forward, just beginning to hook up. And I thought, man, this is it. You know, we're, we're going to get this thing. What was that feeling like at 16th pole? Uh, well, it, it really started about the time I went by a Rossi and I realized that, you know, this, this is really, this is in my grasp if I don't fall off. So <laughs> I said, Let me, don't, don't fall off, don't fall off. But going past the eighth pole, eighth pole when, I, when I got to the lead, there was a feeling that started down in the pit of my stomach that it's absolutely indescribable. It just, and it just grew with every jump as we neared the wire. And when we went under the finish line, it just, it just erupted. It was, uh, I just, I just stood up and went to thanking Jesus for the joy of, of, uh, for, for the privilege, the blessing of having experienced the victory in that great race. Uh, you know, I'd come second several times previous to that. And I thought I had an idea of what that would feel like. I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. If, if I, if it was up around about the moon, uh, the feeling was really just a little bit north of the sun. I mean, it was, it was, unbelievable uh, so in all the derby you wrote in all I'm the sorry. wonderful derby mount i'm sorry in all the wonderful derby mounts and winners and not winners but all the wonderful derby horses you rode did you think lily t was going to be the one I, to this day that was the one you know well you know i i'd probably gone into the race with a, a little higher level of confidence in some of the previous races easy goer for instance uh 49er uh, unbridled <clears throat> uh, beat me on Summer Squall, but, uh, uh, you know, Wild Again showed me very clearly that if you're in them, you can win them, and so I, I, I went into every race thinking that I could win. Uh, realistically, on paper, I probably, I, I had maybe better opportunities previous to Lily T, uh, but the racing gods were on our side that day, and I couldn't have been happier for Mr. Uh, Mr. Partee, the owner, uh, Mr. Whiting, Lynn, my dear friends, uh, to win that race for them was was extra, extra special. So you continued on through your career and then you ran into some inj injury issues and you thought about hanging it up and you did in 2005. What went into that decision, which I'm sure was emotional? You had ridden over 40,000 races um, and you had ridden a horse that won a race, and I got a quote here that it says that you had never ridden one and not had any emotion in winning. Could you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Well, in, in 2004, I had a little problem with my hip. Um, it was just an, an irritating, painful, um, it turned out to be a torn labrum inside my hip socket uh, that we ultimately got taken care of. But uh, it was it was causing me to be a little sour and just not 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 enjoying what I was doing. Uh, so over the winter of 2004 2005, I, I worked with a therapist, 
I got all the all the mobility back in there, but there was still a catch. Uh, and so I they, they injected my hip in, in early February, uh, discovered that I had this torn labrum and uh, that needed to be taken care of and to eliminate the problem. Uh, my my uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, uh, friend um, said that that um, he he suggested that I go to Colorado to to get that done. Um, at the time, my daughter was a senior in high school. She was on the cheerleading squad, and the, they were cheering for the girls' uh, basketball team, and the girls were winning everything. And I said, "We're going to have to put this off because." This is my last chance to dance with my daughter and, and uh, I wanted to be with her. So we anyhow, make a long story short, at the end of March, uh, uh, they lost out on the, it, it, it stayed at the first go around. And so I called the doctor up and he said, can you be here as soon as you can? And so I went to Colorado, they operated, surgery went good. I rehabbed for a month. I went back the week before the Derby and he cleared me to go to riding. I immediately thought, oh, maybe I can get him out in the Derby. I hadn't hadn't missed the Derby for 21 years. Uh, but then I, I thought about that again. I said, you don't come off the bench in the bottom of the ninth and and uh, go to the pitcher's mound. Uh, you know, you don't you haven't been to the haven't been to the ballpark in three or four months and do that. You, you know, the, the, it's just too important to race uh, and means too much to think you can come off the sidelines and do that. But anyway, I, I came back. I started getting on horses and. A couple of weeks later, started riding. In uh, the first major event after I'd had the, the hip surgery uh, uh, was uh, the Fleur de Lis here at Churchill Downs. Um, I rode a filly called Two Trail Sioux. That doesn't sound right. It was. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, that rolled off my tongue, and then it didn't. It didn't sound correct. But anyway, for Wally Delossi, I had never been on her before, and and. Uh, she broke, ran away from the gate, uh, and then got a little anxious in the body of the race. And when she did finally settle, I wasn't sure if she had settled or if she just ran out of gas. Uh, we were on the lead, and when we turned for home, a couple of horses ran up on her, and she gathered herself. And I, so I knew I had a little bit of horse left. To make a long story short, uh, she winds up winning the race. And as we're, we're headed for the finish line, and I know that victory was, was within my grasp, uh, to me, it was an indication that I could still compete at that level. Uh, the surgery and the time off uh, hadn't diminished my skills and, and made it so that I couldn't compete at that level. And, and I was waiting for a, a feeling of euphoria, uh, a feeling like, all right, we're back. And when we went into the finish line, there was no feeling. Um, I've ridden over 40,000 races, and that was the only race in which uh, there was there I'm either happy or sad or disappointed or angry something but there was no emotion none and uh, when I stood up my knees about buckled I'm like what is going on here and I came home and I shared that with my wife and we prayed about it and I was getting no no clear gut, cut direction I went back and I finished out the Churchill spring meet went to Delaware and rode that filly in the Delaware Park Handicap she ran second and, and uh, uh, Dr. David Caburn, my good friend, the orthopedic surgeon, had gone with me uh, to Delaware that day. And on the way back, I was sharing with him that, David, there's something, I'm just unsettled in my spirit. I'm, I just, I need to get alone and, and seek the face of God, see what he would have for me. And uh, David at the time had a, a cabin over on the Kentucky River down in the Palisades. <clears throat> I don't know if you know where that is, down below Wilmore there. No, I haven't been down there. Yeah, a beautiful place. But anyway, he said, um, uh, you're welcome to go to the cabin, stay as long as you need. And so I went down there in, in, in early August, um, got alone with the Lord. Uh, I wish that I could say that I got on my knees and just said, Father, uh, just show me what you want me to do. But I didn't. Obviously, I loved the sport and loved riding. And so I tried to cut a deal with him. Uh, I told him, you know, I was riding in good form. I'm in good shape. And I'm just 30 winners behind Shoemaker on the all-time win list. And I, I thought that, you know, I could surpass him pretty quickly. And that would look good on my resume. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't carry any weight with him. And so then I informed him as how much my horses had earned, you know, $297 million. And I was riding some pretty nice horses. And they, I could have I surpassed $300 million by the end of the year. Uh, that didn't carry any weight with the Lord. 
And finally, I just, I just broke down crying. And I said, Father, I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to do what you want me to do. And at that moment, Sean, it was like he picked me up and held me. Uh, just comforted me. Uh, I was, it wasn't like he was giving me any clear direction at that point. Just holding me. Just, it was just a oneness with the Lord that was indescribable. And, and that lasted for three days. And on the third day, I got up, beautiful fall morning, uh, sun was shining, and I said, well, let me just take a little drive around the countryside. And uh, so I'm in the car driving, no, no music, just got the windows down, just enjoying this oneness with the Lord and, and the beauty of God's creation. And I don't recall inviting the devil to get in the car with me, uh, but all of a sudden there he was tapping me on the shoulder, figuratively speaking, in the spiritual realm, he's tapping me on the shoulder. I'm like, what, 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 what do you want? And he said, what are you going to do? Well, what do you mean, what am I going to do? Well, are you going to keep riding? You're going to retire? What are you doing? You're out here looking for answers. You've got to make a decision. And I just remember I was white knuckled. I mean, on the steering wheel and, and clenching my teeth and my stomach's in a knot. Uh, and, and, and finally, through clenched teeth, I said, it's time, isn't it? Boom. That was it. I knew that I knew that I knew I'd heard from God. It was time to close the book on that chapter in my life and move forward doing God only knows what. But there was almost immediately a renewed enthusiasm in the pit of my stomach, but it wasn't a renewed enthusiasm to go into win races. It was a renewed enthusiasm to go into share the gospel. It became very apparent that we'd spent 22 years building this incredible platform and I was to take this platform and to use it to promote the cause of Christ. Um, and talk about that a little bit. After you retired, you did some work on the backstretch. You joined the racetrack chaplaincy, which you're still involved with to this day. You built the chapel on the backstretch. Talk a little bit about what you did from 2005 to now, Pat. Well, I'm, I'm currently the president of the, the council for the Kentucky Racetrack Chaplaincy, <clears throat> which we oversee the activities of uh, we have two chaplains here at Churchill Downs. Uh, we have one that we oversee that works at Ellis Park, excuse me, two that work at Ellis Park in, in Henderson. And, uh, and then we have one that works at River Downs and in, in, uh, uh, Turfway Park in Northern Kentucky, uh, as well as ministering to some of the training facilities out in, in Oldham County. Uh, and so my involvement now is not with directly sharing the gospel, but it's helping those that are sharing the gospel. And, and uh, be, that being the chaplains, immediately after I retired, I'd done some, some international travel with the uh, Racetrack Chaplaincy of America. Uh, we went to Chile, Argentina, Uruguay. We was in, in Korea. We were in uh, Australia and New Zealand, meeting with uh, uh, track management and leaders of the horsemen's groups. Uh, showing them what we were doing here in regards to sharing the gospel in the horse racing industry and soliciting their support to help establish ministries in those areas. And, and so I'd, I'd done a good bit of traveling, uh, but now I, I, I do a, a, well, I haven't with the onset of COVID and, and, uh, and then some family issues uh, last fall, my wife was, was ill and, and my mother was ill. And so I'd, I'd had to postpone all of my speaking engagements, but I'm very blessed. I get invited to speak at, at, uh, to various uh, groups, uh, prayer breakfasts, uh, youth groups, uh, various churches, some, some corporate events, uh, but I'm not a motivational speaker. I, I want to go in and share my story as we have done here today, uh, showing people from the depths that the Lord drug me up out of, how he has blessed me, and what a joy I receive out of knowing, loving, and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, my my hold my desire echoes the, the, you know the lord says i desire that none would perish but that all would come to know and to love and to trust in him and that's my desire i, I want to share the love of christ with all that i come in contact with uh that they too might come to know and to love and to trust in him well that covers about the last four or five questions i had for you i want to go back and i want to ask two more and then we'll be finished and i really appreciate your time and your openness tonight uh, the discussion's been wonderful. And I, you know, you are a motivational speaker, Pat. Uh, don't shortchange yourself. Um, two questions. One, if you could go back in time and have one ride over again, who would it be on? 
Have you ever had somebody asked you this question before? 40,000 uh, mounts. Who would you ride again? If I if I had a race that I could do over and ride differently? Yep. Hypothetical. You get one shot. You get a do over. Who would it be on? Who do you think it would be? Well, Who we've discussed that in the office. Somebody in the office said 49er in the Derby. I said easy goer in the Preakness. You got it. Easy goer in the you Preakness? Yeah, I, I I have no I have no qualms with the way that I rode 49er in the Derby. There was a big question going into that race whether, uh, you know, whether by Mr. Prospector if he could get a mile and a quarter, and they had put me on him specifically so that I could get him to turn off, to relax, to rate, and uh, you know that day in the Derby he broke, he was right off of winning colors going into the turn, uh, her like Sunday Silence. She ran, she ran around the turn like a hoop around a barrel. So when we dropped into the turn, she opened up on me. And I knew at that point that if, if I tried to stay close to her, if I moved on 49er, he was gonna take off, run off and ultimately not finish. And so I, I, I let him settle, I let him drop back. When I pulled the trigger coming off the turn, I thought I had her. Uh, you know, I, I, I ran up, I, as I got to her, I said, I'm gonna beat her. And then she, she was game as hickory. And when I got to her, she, I mean, she dug in and fought and I came up a neck short. I had no qualms with my ride on him, but I had some qualms with my ride on easy goer. And, uh, you know, there's a racetrack saying the, sh the smaller the margin of defeat, the greater the room for second guessing. <laughs> uh, but I really believe, you know, that, that, that day, easy goer hadn't put much into the Derby. So we came into the Preakness pretty fresh. He jumped in the air at the break, jumped right into the bridle. He was aggressive going into the turn, was right in behind Sunday Silence. <clears throat> so we followed him around the turn. When we got in the backside, Easy Goer wasn't, he wasn't settling the way I wanted him to. And so I thought, let me just pull out, give him his head a little bit, let him lengthen his stride and maybe he'll, he'll settle in. And when I pulled him out and give him his head, he run up alongside of Sunday Silence and Patrick looked over there and, and seen it was me and decided that he was gonna carry me to the outside fence. Uh, he started carrying me out, out, out. And at that point, is that's where I made the mistake. Um, you know, if he, he's the horse to beat, he's the derby winner. If he carries me 20 wide, he's 19 wide, right? I mean, that's common sense, right? But no, 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 no. I'm like, wait a minute, Patrick, you ain't doing that today. So I let easy go or run. He let, when he seen that I was gonna try to get the jump on him and put him back down to where he belonged, he let Sunday Silence run. I have never put the clock on it to see how fast we went from the three quarter pole to the half mile pole. But I, I assure you, we, we were getting it. And now we, I finally got the advantage on him. I eased him back down where he belonged. We're coming to the, to the far turn and Houston was on the lead with Angel Cordero and he's trying to slow him down, got his feet in the dashboard. So when we get to the turn, he doesn't fall into the turn smoothly. He kind of goes straight for a couple of jumps. Patrick's in the middle with Sunday silence. I'm on the outside. All of a sudden, there's no room because Easy Goer changed leads and dropped in. Patrick had to steady. Well, I let Easy Goer, you know, just his momentum carried him on up to and past Houston in the middle of the turn. I knew that Sunday silence was going to come back at us. I just didn't expect him to come back quite as quick as he did. I mean, he recovered like that take nothing away from him. I mean, he's, he was a good horse and a fighter, but he got back in the game almost immediately. Now he's got the jump on me and he come over and bumped me a couple of times, pushed me down on the fence, um, a position that Easy Goer had never been in. And he's a little intimidated. Uh, now we come off the turn and P-Val is riding me tight as he should have been, but Easy Goer don't want to change leads. And so I, finally about the eighth pole, he changed back to his correct lead and he pulled back in front of Sunday Silence. And I thought, that's it. We'll just go on from here. And about that time, his legs just went rubber. I mean, he was done. He, he, I'd used him up. And he's, he's, so he, he's fighting, but he's rubber-legged. And so at that point, since we had been jostling and Pat had been laying on me pretty good, I said, let me turn his head out. Maybe I can bump Sunday Silence, maintain my advantage, and I'll just take it up with the stewards afterwards. Well, Easy Gore was so tired that when I turned his head out, his head turned, but his body didn't follow. And P-Val got us, you know, Sunday Silence got us. I mean, it was a great race. 
I mean, it was a thrilling race. It was one of the best uh, races but, I've but, ever seen. You know, the, the, the final outcome was I got beat a nose. Now you come to the Belmont and where, where I was on the outside of him around the turn and, you know, in the Preakness, when p let me, you know, started carrying me out there, I should have just let him do it. He would have got to the half mile pole to turn. He just swooped away from me, dropped into the turn and opened up. But now I've got three eighths of a mile to get easy goers legs up underneath of him, get him going. And I believe, I believe with all my heart that he would have done to him in the, in the Preakness exactly what he'd done to him in the Belmont. But guess what? There's no do-overs. <laughs> But if well, I had it's, one, if it's I fun had to one, speculate. <laughs> so last, last question for you. You served some time as a regulator, and I think a, a lot of people don't know that you spent some time on the Kentucky State Racing Commission, and we actually have that in common. And I just want to get your overview of the state of the sport, the new riding crop rules, and where you see the sport going the next five, ten years. Well, I think horse racing is very resilient and, and it will survive. Um, the basic element will remain the same. Uh, obviously, the, you know, the, the, there's so much uh, competition for the entertainment dollar, if you want to call it that, expendable cash. And uh, uh, I think the powers to be are working hard to promote the sport, to present the sport, uh, to raise up a new group of, of fans um, uh, to keep the sport alive. You know, where the, 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 the energy for the game, uh, the, the dollar's wager is what drives the engine. And, and so there, I know the powers to be are working hard to, <clears throat> to raise up that group, uh, another group of horse racing fans that will continue to support us. Um, and, and I trust that, that, uh, that they'll get that done. Uh, with regards to the, to the, to the riding crops and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that by and for, I think we're trying hard to appease the, the watchdog groups, uh, PETA. Um, you know, I know, that the riding crop does not hurt the horse. Um, it, it, you know, when, when a rider's, they can, they can get cut in the flank, you can hit them in the wrong spot, uh, but the riding crops today, I don't know if you've seen them. The, yeah. I mean, you, you can take that thing and whack your hand as hard as you want. You can't even make it sting. You, you know, you can't hurt your hand. Uh, the whips that we were using, now you could slap your hand and, 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 and put a welt in your hand. It was possible, but um, uh, you know, I, I there, there, there's there's a place in the middle where I think they'll meet together. I think the riders, the riding colony, uh, track management, the horsemen's groups. I think they're all going to come together and and uh, and come up with a universal whip rule, uh, which they need to do. That there needs probably needs to be some universal rules. Period. Uh, so that. You know, you go to this state and you can only hit them twice and then you get a, you got to give them a chance. You can't hit them over six times. You go to this state and it's seven times or I don't know. Uh, you know we can't keep track of all of that. When you're in the heat of the battle, oh, oh, did I hit them five times or six times? I, you know, the, the riding crop has probably been overused in the past because from a rider's perspective, uh, and, and from the fans, from the owners, the trainers, they're watching the race. And if you come down there and, and you get beat like a, a, a neck or a nose or a small amount, and you never hit the horse, everybody's going to say, if you would just hit him, he'd have won, right? Well, in the past, riders have used the whip to convince the owner, trainer, gamblers that they're giving their very best, that they're very, getting the very best out of the horse. I think that they should entrust the stewards to make the judgment call. Uh, I, I think, I think, first of all, I think they should have a retired jockey in the stand at every racetrack yeah. uh, from a, to, so that, uh, or at least involved with 
disciplinary action toward riders watching the races, that aspect of it, uh, because they have a handle on what's going on out there. Every track uh, I've they, ever worked at has had a jock in the in the stand and it's made it, it really does make a difference. I agree with you there. Well, they can bring that to that perspective to the table. And, and if that was the case, and, and even if there isn't, uh, those that haven't even watched, they, they, can, they can watch and tell if a rider, if, if a jockey is abusing or overusing the whip, um, and they should have the, the flexibility to discipline as they see fit. But. Well, Pat, I want to thank you for your time tonight. This has been wonderful. It was nice reminiscing with you, talking about your life story, um, your conversion, everything that you've gone through in, in an incredible and interesting life. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me on. This has been, you know, it's been a great walk down memory lane and sharing and, and uh, I, I love sharing my story. Uh, yeah, you've got quite a story. To it, I hope that in the midst of it, that uh, uh, people recognize and realize that I am what I am by the grace of God. Uh, maybe they see something in me that they want, uh, and may that be the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Pat. And thanks to everybody for joining us here at the Speaker Series and through the entirety of the fall. Remember, tonight's panel and all our previous panels are available to watch. Uh, the equine program at the University of Louisville sincerely appreciates your support, and we look forward to seeing you next fall when we do this all again. Thank you, everybody, and have a good evening.